Welcome everyone, Christine here to talk about how to play and win a campaign when you are literally surrounded by enemies. And some campaigns can f certainly fall in this category. Kislev has this issue, Ali Fanar over here has this issue, because he is surrounded by enemies. He starts a war with Karen Carr to his direct south. He does have a Silostra over here in the Twisted Glade, and she doesn't like him. Uh, especially to the west you have Nagron, Malekith, to the north you have Helebron, to the east you have Belakor over here in Albion, and although Wolf One eventually can become a significant aid, especially if you meet them diplomatically, like if you get in contact with Alarial and Tyrion and get trading relations, they can be substantial partners, and eventually you can confederate them, but first need to meet them. But your immediate situation, early game, surrounded by enemies. Mid game doesn't necessarily get better because then Malekif and Helbron are gonna start throwing in their doom stacks and they're gonna throw a lot of units with range power, armor piercing, very effective units. And then eventually you'll either have to deal with Valkyrie or Sigvold, and, or in the worst case scenario, both of them at the same time while constantly being harassed by Bellacor. So, how do you deal with a situation like that? Well, I've done a campaign as a Leafanar, but this is not really about him. This is about how you deal with this kind of situation, which you can encounter during the course of many campaigns, and it can lead to stuck campaigns or the endless loop of violence where you're, you're not really making progress or you're trading territory. You take some territory, but you lose some territory in other places. So how do you deal with that particular situation? Well, you need to have a plan to begin with. From turn one, decide what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, how you're going to accomplish it. So in this case, I start with the monoliths. One of the first things I'm obviously going to do is start getting some Melvin trinkets for economy. I'm going to beat this army, take the shrine, and get some units recruited. Now, as a Leafanar, one of the benefits, of course, is I get influence and these missions that give you various benefits. In this case, like growth to all provinces, money, and 28 influence. That influence can then be used to hire a lord, either a prince or an archmage. Uh, during the course of your campaign that can give you uh, various benefits. A caster lord can be very beneficial uh, during the course of a campaign, though a prince might be actually worth investing in better from the very start of your campaign because a prince can be really powerful in combat and can offer some really solid uh, campaign benefits. Also, it's a question of the Lord effects, like the Prince Lord effects, uh, I find, tend to be more useful on the campaign side of things, though mages certainly have a lot of combat potential. Uh, but yeah, take these out, take the Black Light Tower, take Karen Carr. But, of course, one of the issues early game here, and this is always something to never ignore, what are your other neighbors going to do? What is their campaign plan and how do you adjust it? Well, one of the things that Salostra wants to do, she you doesn't like you. Chance, you do have a minus 40 aversion. And the way the AI works uh, when it comes to the player, now the AI hates now, the player regardless, but there are certainly some things that will push the AI over the edge against you. So aversion is one thing, and you holding territory that they may want, that they're primed to take, is also something else. So for instance, if I were to take the Black Forests over here, then Silostra would, declare, would be far more likely to declare war on me than if I just left her alone. But you can also take actions to reduce this even further. The for instance, I could uh, I uh, join her war against the Forge Bound, in exchange for non-aggression pact on turn one. Of course, this will leave the monoliths exposed over here to that minor uh, Dark Elven faction, but it could be worth to get that non-aggression pact because getting that non-aggression pact would potentially give you a couple of turns before she does uh, declare war on you. So those kind of moves can be very useful. Alternatively, I could decide, okay, I'm going to take this initial province, but then just march directly here and take some of this territory, or even go for Silostra herself when she least expects it. Also, because I'm in territory with a bunch of factions that are pretty hostile towards me, uh, then you can deal with the downside, of course, to the reliabil your reliability for breaking any kind of agreement with these factions. Though, bear in mind... You do that, then that's 
going to cause factions like Malekith and Helebron to be even more likely to declare war on you immediately because that will uh, matter for the AI decision making. So those kind of things do matter. Another thing is actually encountering factions. So I don't meet Telebron here until I take the Black Light Tower. Uh, Bellacor until I take the territory in the east. I don't encounter him. And Ulfwan and the Ulfwan factions until I take the Twisted Glade or until I sail over there. So just bear in mind that, that actually meeting a faction in the first place is important you can avoid doing that you could raise some territory in order to avoid doing that like for instance if you don't want to deal with Bellacor during the course of the campaign you could just raise this entire province to the ground not necessarily the wisest idea though but ju just it is just an option it can be useful in certain situations in certain campaigns to actually do so to raise a province to raise a settlement in a province or the entire province instead of taking it over because it leaves room between you and the eye if the eye wants to take it they have to spend money on that what when you're in this kind of situation what you're really looking for are means to delay the ai to delay the ai attacks or to ensure that those attacks are happening where you want them when you want them in the most ideal circumstance but especially where is something you can control so for instance here Halibron and Bellacor can only arrive via the sea so that means because they're arriving via the sea they're not really going to have movement points when they land so that means that Slaver's Point, Black Light Tower and Karen Carr are where they're generally going to uh, land of course Black Creek Spire that, that doesn't mean that Bellacor can't land near Black Creek Spire it means he's far more vulnerable if he does so whereas if he attacks where he if he goes for Karen Carr, he can attack immediately, but there's obviously going to be some benefits there because it's a walled settlement. So that's just the start. Now, I'll progress through the campaign. I'll just give a couple of more, more pointers because this situation is just the beginning. As, this as the campaign progresses, as you conquer more territory and as you have to expand and send your armies across the board, things do get more complicated. Progressing during the campaign here, it's turn six. Some of the assassination missions that I had uh, have been done, or rather I succeeded in the first one, the second one was done by someone else, and this character, he's way too far away for me to be able to deal with. But at this point I've encountered Helebron. I still haven't encountered Bellacor, though I likely will once I take Karen Carr. But here's what's, what I've done. I did uh, make a deal with uh, Silas Ray. I didn't get an integration pact actually with her here, but I did make a deal where she gave me a bit of money and in exchange I declared war on that uh, Dark Elven faction that she was at war with. And that kind of action I tend to find if you declare war on the enemy um, uh, of a particular faction, they tend to be more reluctant on declaring war on you. Just bear in mind the Lifanar is Silostra's natural enemy. And the Monoliths in particular, if you lose them, that is a significant downside. So there are certain settlements during the course of your campaign that you absolutely do not wish to use. Now, another thing I've done this campaign, I've recruited a number of Shadow Walkers. Actually, one of the things I did on turn one is I recruit, I killed the initial enemy army and I used the influence to recruit a prince that had a pretty decent effect. And with that prince, I spent two turns recruiting two Shadow Walkers. So that's how I have four. And then I used a bunch of global recruitment to uh, get uh, some Shadow, well, combination of uh, local recruitment and global recruitment to get a bunch of Shadow Warriors. And, uh, of course, these archers. That's why I have a full stack here at turn 6. One of the crucial things to be said about any campaign is the early part of any campaign is the most difficult part. If you can get that under control, generally you can win the campaign or make things a lot easier. Unless you, you're in this kind of starting position. That's where the rule kind of flies out the window. Because you do still have to care about the mid game as well and the late game, of course. Now, here's the thing, though. Getting a full stack and preserving that stack, getting you an experience, all very, very important stuff. Now, what I want to point out here, though, is what I'm really doing here with 
uh, my army. So this army just has the Lord. I haven't had time to recruit units for it. And I really can't afford having a full stack for him at this particular point. A couple of units, maybe just transferring the archers, just to leave the slots open for a leaf and art to get more shadow walkers and shadow warriors. Absolutely, maybe even getting another army over here, uh, another lord to get to start recruiting more shadow walkers. Once I take Karen Car, and I would be sacking it uh, for the extra money that will provide. Can I offer Absolutely, um, but here's. Uh, here's something to know about settlements, because one of the things that can slow you down the most in a campaign, and if you're dealing with a situation like this or any difficult campaign situation, the worst thing that you can do is stop to besiege a settlement. Now, I might have to do this in this particular situation, just because there's a very powerful garrison in Karen Kar. But at the moment, I'm only at war with them. I'm at war with no one else. I've taken some damage due to an auth resolve when I faced their main army in an open field because I said, you know what, screw it. This, it, it was just more favorable to auth resolve it. I got rid of the eagle that Alif and Art uh, starts with. Just don't like it as a unit, it's a pretty worthless unit. Uh, but one of the things to be said about sieges, having two armies can be really useful in a siege if both of them have siege attacker. But even if one of them doesn't and he doesn't have siege attacker, he would gain it if he got his uh, dragon mount uh, or griffin and then sun dragon into star dragon. That would uh, give him siege attacker, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the benefit of a second army is that especially with siege attacker there like you could have ballista in that, that second army that would give siege attacker and that will allow you to attack instantly the benefit there is that the second army like you can attack with your first army run out the timer if you're using it or just withdraw if you're feeling the outcome is not favorable um and then just come again especially with ranged armies this is something that works because what you do with a ranged army is you don't want most of the time with the vast majority of factions actually entering past the walls unless you've blown massive gaps and those walls is generally speaking a suicide mission You're, you'll take massive damage with your army it's not worth the cost so what you want to do in a siege especially with range centric armies like if i rush these guys through the walls these melee units and the shades and the dark shards will just slaughter me along with the towers and the magic of course. Uh, so what I want to do is park all these units outside of the walls. Now, if you have siege, you know, if you have ballista, eagle claw, bolt throwers, yeah, you would you would just destroy the towers. But vast majority of settlements, though not the black light tower, funnily enough, but even that does have it. But vast majority of settlements do have what is a dead zone, and a dead zone is a location where the towers can't shoot. For here, for this particular settlement type, it's in this particular area because there's no towers here, or uh, or it's around here. Like you can deploy your troops here or here, and towers won't really be too much bother. But especially on this side because there's no towers here. I believe there are some towers over on this side, but there's no towers on this side. So you deploy here. You avoid the towers here, you snipe the enemies, you concentrate your fire. Because one of the problems in sieges, if you're the defender, is it's difficult to concentrate all your range units at one spot. If you're an attacker, you can just mass your range units at one particular point and just obliterate everything in your path, unless you're using gunpowder units, in which case you're screwed, pretty much. And that's how you win uh, sieges. You don't want to spend time besieging a settlement. Uh, though, another thing you can do in a siege... Let's say you're besieging an enemy, right? And they've got a full stack in the settlement. Well, if they've got a full stack in that settlement, it's their last settlement, crucially. You could just wait one turn, if you can. Or, if they're building up a full stack, right? If you're driving the enemy towards their last settlement and they're starting to build a stack, they you might get the situation where they get the second army that's just outside the settlement. Now, sometimes when you attack that second army, they will run away. But other times when you attack it, they will stand and fight. And the army from the settlement, including the settlement garrison, will rush out to help out. And that's something you can use to your advantage. Now, finally, regardless of what you do during the course of your campaign, you're going to encounter a situation like this. 
Halibron has declared war against me and is marching an army to attack. Now, since Black uh, Creek Spire is a bit inland, uh, then that means this army is no heading way. towards Slaver Point. So I've set this army in ambush right here. So when this army lands, no. and it would overwhelm the garrison, even uh, on many difficulties of this game, um, but by We're setting it in ambush, then I'm luring the AI into a trap. Using ambush stance effectively is important. But here's the most important lesson. Beyond all the tricks, tips and tricks and all that, here's the most significant lesson that you can learn when it comes to dealing with a situation like this, which you can encounter in a large variety of campaigns, not just one which starts like this. Though in this campaign, you're always going to encounter the situation where you do have to make these kind of decisions but what is important about every campaign is maintaining the initiative don't let the ai dictate your decisions you d decide how your campaign is going to go so over here in the north i wouldn't care if tarak showed up with a full stack of troops what he's gonna do just raise a couple of tier one settlements i don't care yes my economy can take a nosedive i'm pretty short on money right now no problem no problem when it comes to that, right? Just out resolve this, uh, sack it. There, money uh, issue solved. It is good to have a buffer of money so you don't go bankrupt if someone sacks your settlements, but most of the time, it actually doesn't really. Um, it actually won't necessarily be too much of an issue during the course of your campaign. Besides, as a Leafanar, there are ways of getting money with the assassination missions that I am now going to entertain. But it is important that you decide the course of your campaign. Don't let the AI attacks on your territory decide that for you. Unless the territory that's under threat is something like Skaven Blight or Caracake Peaks if you're playing as Belagar, it does not matter unless your economy is going to completely go under and you're going to go bankrupt though that's one of the things you have to be careful about is how many armies can you afford uh, reasonably speaking during the course of your campaign so those are some of the things to bear in mind like i could just spend the entire campaign in that miserable starting position but since i came here to ulfwan well i've just unlocked trade with Tyrion and Elariel, and I'm going to start building strong State diplomatic relations with both of them Lassa as a result of that. Or with all three of the legendary lords on Ulfwan. So, economic issues solved. Now, another thing is to adapt to changing circumstances. Now, most of the time, I would not bother taking Nagarith. Or if I took Nagarif, I would only take the Shrine of Cain for the quest that uh, you do have as a Leafanar, and then just sell it all to Alariel because she does have the tendency to take some of it. I'm actually surprised during the course of this campaign, which is unmodded, unlegendary, very hard, that she actually has taken absolutely nothing, though she has slaughtered their armies for me. It's just a bit of a weird situation but you gotta uh, you gotta adapt to changing Jim's circumstances so over here I might just take all of it or I might just uh, ha let her take it anyway and in exchange like if I do uh, if I do that for her I'll probably get a military alliance with her and that builds uh, that will build strength and it is worth the cost even if half my uh, half of my territory over here was burned to the ground, it would be worth the price of what I just accomplished in Wolf 1 to send the Leafanar's army over here. Now, long term, you always need to have a long term plan. What do you want to achieve during the course of a campaign? How do you want to achieve it? Like to achieve your short campaign victory conditions, which does give you significant buffs, in this case, taking out Nagaron. So I am going to have to go back north. Uh, to deal with Nagron, but after that, I'm pretty much free to do whatever the hell I want, as long as it contributes towards the unification of Wolf One and wiping out the Dark Elves. So Marathi, Halibron, all that. Though I will likely encounter uh, Sigvald and have to deal with him as well. I haven't encountered Belacord uh, yet, I, uh, yet though. Which is a bit weird, because generally I do expect him to be running around the ocean. Uh, coming within my line of sight, 
posing a problem during the course of my campaign, invading with full stacks, but it is something. You should never invade Bellacor, by the way. Uh, just a note. Some things are just not worth doing during the course of a campaign. Because let's say you take Albion. Well, great. You just made yourself em enemy uh, number one to all of Norska. That is a bad idea. When you've already got plenty of enemies uh, to start with. Like, pick your fights. And again, always uh, try and dictate the course of your campaign. Don't let it be dictated for you. So, here... Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Alariel takes Tor uh, Drenel. Maybe so. All right, in that case, I'll just leave Wolf one. Alariel will be in a strong position. They'll wipe out Noctilus. Tyrion, Alfarian, and Al Alariel will wipe out Noctilus. Nakari, maybe along the way, I just swipe the shrine over here. Give that to Alariel as well. Why not? Um, well, why not? Or just, uh, just go to war against Nakari, casually speaking, and then get on a ship via the port over here. No problemo. And then I have a meg the Mega High Elf and Alliance. Just by coming here, I've already improved my campaign odds by a significant amount. And that's one of the things uh, to know. And this is also an important point. When you're in this kind of situation where you're surrounded by enemies, Try and make allies. Allies that will do your dirty work for you. Now, as a Lifanar, as some other campaigns, you may not have that luxury. But in the vast majority of campaigns, you can get some AI partners to hold a front that you don't particularly care about and to advance in. Like if you're playing as Kislev, the Norskan front, you don't want to spend too much time or spend a minimal amount of time there. So getting AI partners to hold that front for you while you're busy off conquering Sylvania is a much better decision during the course of the campaign. Now, for a Leaf and Arp, you don't really have this decision. You are going to be the front line. But just securing Ulfwan means your allies are not busy dealing with these pointless factions and can actually help you. And you are actually building those alliances in the first place what to begin with. Do you wish to so those are the kind of things that do matter during the course of a campaign and how you deal with friends. this kind of situation. Quasi Near signing out, don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.